Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you to Barbara and Anne for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here, uh, and thank you all for coming on a beautiful Friday afternoon. I know you probably have better places to be, so I'm appreciative of the fact that you're here with me. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to tell you about my research. As Barbara mentioned, I'm interested broadly in questions around the politics of migration, immigrant integration, transnationalism, cultural hybridity, identity, and belonging. And my current book manuscript explores these questions through the lens of death. I examine how immigrant communities manage and make sense of death in a country that they don't necessarily view as their own, and how they negotiate ideas about home, community, belonging, and identity in and through their experiences with death. Now, we don't uh, usually think about death and migration together, except perhaps in the context of the growing number of people who perish during risky border crossings. The haunting image of Aylan Kurdi, a three-year-old Kurdish child whose dead body washed ashore in Turkey, brought home the social, political, and humanitarian costs and consequences of the ongoing civil conflict in Syria, which has resulted in the displacement of millions of people in the region. According to the International Organization for Migration, the Mediterranean Sea is now the deadliest border in the world. With nearly 5,000 deaths recorded in 2016, approximately 3,000 deaths reported in 2017, and more than 400 already this year. But today I want to argue that death has other political implications beyond the humanitarian concerns raised by the fortification of European borders and the refugee crisis. My research explores how the governance of the dead is intimately linked to the construction of the nation. In my book, I examine what happens to migrant bodies after they die. I start from the premise that death is not simply a negation or an erasure of being, or the destruction of the self. Death is a productive and generative moment because death is universal and the dead are universally meaningful. The dead body matters everywhere across time and place. It matters in wildly disparate ideological and religious circumstances. It matters even in the absence of any particular belief about the soul, about an afterlife or a god. It matters, as historian Thomas Lecoeur has written, because, quote, the, dead need the, li the living need the dead far more than the dead need the living. I'm particularly interested in how death is experienced and managed in the context of migration, a phenomenon that I have termed death out of place. My book focuses uh, primarily on Turkish and Kurdish communities in Germany. I ask, where does a dead body belong? And what might dead bodies tell us about belonging? As I hope to demonstrate today, families, religious communities, and states all have a vested interest in the fate of dead bodies. And in contexts where the boundaries of the nation and its members are contested, burial decisions are political decisions that are linked to lar larger symbolic struggles over the meaning of home and homeland. While burial in Germany offers a powerful means for migrants and their children to assert political membership and to foster a sense of belonging, the widespread practice of posthumous repatriation for burial in the countries of origin illustrates the continued importance of transnational ties and serves in as, an, as an indictment of an exclusionary socio-political order. In both situations, the corpse is central to localizing and grounding political claims for recognition. As I aim to show today, this is a highly contentious process wherein different groups struggle over where dead bodies should go and what they should signify. So let me give you a few examples uh, to illustrate why and how dead bodies are consequential for political life. First, all states establish a range of institutions, laws, and practices to oversee transitions from life to death, including what happens to dead bodies. While states often delegate certain responsibilities concerning the dead to private, social, and religious entities, they usually claim ultimate authority over the definition and governance of the dead within their jurisdiction. 
through a combination of legislation and institutionalized procedures. As such, the death of a person is an occasion for the performance of sovereignty. Moreover, the management of the dead is central to the constitution, consolidation, and territorialization of national and political communities across the world. As far as the management of exceptional dead uh, is concerned, we've seen in our own day how the US government erased any trace of Osama bin Laden's body by burying him at sea, while simultaneously preventing uh, the circulation of images like this, uh, of dead American soldiers being returned in flag-draped coffins from the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. In France, the bodies of terrorists are routinely buried in unmarked graves under the cover of darkness. The exceptional dead, particularly those who are viewed as enemies of the state, are at times subject of public spectacle. At other times, they're hidden from sight. This is in part due to the idea that certain dead are polluting, not only in a material sense, but also symbolically. Because their bodies threaten the sanctity of the symbolic order, much effort goes into preventing their burial in particular places, as in the case of Tamerlan Sarnayev, the Boston bomber. Here there's a picture of protesters uh, uh, protesting the uh, idea that Sarnayev might be buried in Boston. At other times, the dead remain anonymous. Another example of the way that states manage the dead in order to consolidate the boundaries of national and political communities can be seen in the rituals surrounding unknown soldiers. The tomb of the unknown soldier is a memorial invented by the Italian, French, and British governments during the last years of the First World War. While state memorials to the dead have a very long history, and in fact Thucydides even writes about the Athenian practice of the empty tomb or cenotaph, the monuments built to unknown soldiers are considered by some scholars as decisively modern phenomena that are emblematic of nationalism. Consider the opening lines of the second chapter of Benedict Anderson's influential book, Imagine Communities. Quote, no more arresting emblems of the modern culture of nationalism exist than cenotaphs and tombs of unknown soldiers. The public ceremonial reverence accorded these monuments precisely because they are either deliberately empty or no one knows who lies inside them has no true precedence in earlier times. Yet void as these tombs are of identifiable mortal remains or immortal souls, they are nonetheless saturated with ghostly national imaginings. This is why so many different nations have such tombs without feeling any need to specify the nationality of their absent occupants. What else could they be but Germans, Americans, or Argentinians? So Anderson goes on to point out the difficulty of imagining a tomb of the unknown Marxist or a cenotaph for fallen liberals. And he argues that nationalism, unlike Marxism or liberalism, is very much concerned with death and immortality, which lends it a strong affinity with religious imaginings. This affinity, which for Anderson is by no means coincidental, is what inspires him to begin his study of the cultural roots of nationalism with death which he characterizes as, quote, the last of a whole gamut of fatalities. So I want to say one more thing about death and the politics of dead bodies before I turn to my uh, case. Because of their powerful symbolism and sacred associations, the dead have the ability to bridge public and private concerns by aligning individual experiences of loss and memory with the interests of different groups, communities, religious organizations, or states. These linkages make the dead both critical to social organization and political mobilization, and therefore essential to historical transformation. Relations with the dead make the transcendent a useful tool in worldly conflicts. And here I'm influenced uh, uh, by the work of anthropologist Catherine Verdery, in particular her book, The Political Lives of Dead Bodies, on uh, transformation in Eastern Europe after the uh, end of communism. Worldly co conflicts are what politics is all about. I see politics as a form of concerted activity among social actors towards specific goals. One of the aims of my research is to broaden the scope of where we see political activity occurring, to see politics in unusual and unexpected places, 
beyond the more formal realms of policy making, institution building, and elections. A broader and more capacious definition of politics allows us to consider how people justify actions, claim and dispute authority, and create and manipulate cultural categories that mediate social life. Human activity is almost always uh, uh, influenced by affective and meaningful dimensions and takes place through complex symbolic processes. In this sense, politics is always a realm of continual struggles over meanings and significations. And I'm influenced here by a long line of interpretive social science inaugurated by Max Weber, who insisted that the pursuit of meaning is at the heart of human activity and that the aim of social analysis is not simply to explain causes but also to understand meanings. In my research, I employ qualitative methods, including interviews and participant observation, to better understand how politics is experienced and interpreted by ordinary citizens in their everyday lives. This is how I approach the question of death out of place. The field of migration studies has generated many insights about the causes and consequences of the movement of living persons, but today I want to show you how the Voyages of the Dead offers us an alternative lens for making, alternative lens for making sense of the politics of belonging, identity, and place. So, the story of Turkish migration to Germany was initially understood by German policymakers as an economic question. The Gastarbeiter, or the guest worker program, was conceived of as a temporary and cyclical program to overcome shortages in the German labor market and to ensure the steady rotation of cheap manpower throughout Germany. It was framed by a myth of return. Between 1955 and 1973, more than 2.5 million foreign workers emigrated to Germany as part of this program. As John Berger notes in his incisive study of foreign workers in Europe, quote, so far as the economy of the metropolitan country is concerned, migrant workers are immortal. Immortal because they are continually interchangeable. They are not born, they are not brought up, they do not get tired, they do not die. But of course, like all people, migrant workers do die. And what should become of them once they do? This is actually a recurrent theme in uh, Turkish-German literary production. As some of you might be familiar with some of these films by Fatih Akın, uh, Imuli, in which uh, the protagonist here, Isa, brings the corpse of his dead uncle back from Germany uh, to Turkey in the trunk of his car. He's stopped at the border. They open it up and he's thrown into jail and he's surprised uh, uh, when the outcome is that the border guards say, okay, you're doing a good deed here, just go on through. That film is, I believe, I, I can't verify this, but based on the story by Güney Dahl, Europa Strasse uh, 5, 19, which was written in 1979, where, uh, again, it's a story of a corpse being brought, this time in a television box, uh, from Germany to Turkey for burial. So um, I'll tell you about uh, my study here. I conducted ethnographic research in Berlin between 2013 and 2016. Here I'm showing you a video here. I'm sorry, it's a little wobbly here of uh, the Friday prayers where people would congregate uh, and often the funerals would be held here in the courtyard of the mosque in Berlin before they were either taken uh, to the airport for repatriation or to the cemetery for local burial. Uh, I was in uh, Germany conducting this work, uh, this research. I, I worked hand in hand with uh, undertakers. Uh, I attended several funerals and the uh, ethnographic work got me pretty up close and personal uh, to these um, funerals and, and, and burials. So I had several research sites uh, which I'll tell you about. The first of them are Islamic funeral funds, uh, which are established to help uh, the kind of logistical and financial aspects of repatriation. I also conducted participant observation with undertakers and death care workers in Berlin and Istanbul. Uh, I examined the uh, representations of personhood and identity in Islamic cemeteries in Germany and finally, I conducted interviews with Turkish and Kurdish families, 
religious leaders, government officials, and civil society associations in Berlin and Istanbul. And I'll tell you about each of these in turn. So the Islamic funeral funds, um, what are they? Essentially, these are uh, uh, like an insurance scheme, but they prefer to avoid the, the uh, term insurance. These are burial funds that people buy into, pay an annual membership fee, and when there's a death, the fund will help uh, pay for and, and do all the logistical support for the funeral. Uh, in Germany, there are at least 10 of these uh, operative uh, that are organized around sectarian and political differences and many of these are um, present in other European countries as well. So here's an advertisement for one of the largest funds uh, which has uh, 300,000 members in uh, Europe and it says here everyone is at the age where they might die, right? And they give you a sort of chart here on the sort of things that they do, official business, uh, religious uh, traditions, the transportation, and the burial. Uh, the two largest funds, uh, which I'll tell you about, one uh, which is uh, through the Milli Gurush organization and the other uh, through an organization connected to the Turkish state, have a combined membership of nearly 500,000 uh, in Europe. Uh, these are similar to funeral funds in other migratory contexts. So as I started doing this research, I realized that in many migratory situations, one of the first uh, things that immigrants, one of the first type of associations that immigrant groups create is to attend to uh, the funeral and burial of their members. So here's an example of a Zimbabwean uh, fund in Europe, um, an uh, article here about insurance coverage for repatriation of bodies of uh, Mexicans living in the United States. So these are modeled in some part after 19th century uh, burial societies, also known as friendly societies, um, which were established in the United States and Britain uh, to avoid the stigma of a pauper's funeral. Right? So people would uh, become members of these funeral funds. When they died, the, the burial society would pay for their uh, burial. The difference uh, here is that the funeral funds that I've studied are transnational in their scope. They're not necessarily intended for local burial, but in fact what I argue is that they provide material uh, incentives uh, for the repatriation of bodies back to the country of origin. And not just material, but also sort of moral imperatives here. So here's two more advertisements for um, uh, the funeral funds. Uh, up here it says, um, have you not yet become a member of DITIB's 200,000 members strong funeral fund? If you haven't, then you should hurry up because death doesn't announce when it will arrive. Right. Um, and then in, on, on the right here, uh, every soul will taste death. That's a Quranic uh, reference. And on, on your most uh, painful days, we are with you. Right. So you can see some of the moral incentives here that they're uh, creating. So um, they describe themselves, I looked at the membership forms, the contracts, all the, uh, all the sort of ways in which uh, they were kind of self-describing. Uh, one of the uh, funds, DTIP here, this is the one connected to the Turkish uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs, uh, says that they were established in 1992 to provide a lasting, practical and secure solution to the serious problem faced by our, by our people who having spent a lifetime in Gurbet, which means something like exile, and out of a longing uh, uh, for their homeland, desire to have their bodies repatriated to our country for burial. In a very short time, this fund has provided for the mutual support and solidarity desired among our citizens and has been the object of great interest and respect. So you can see how they're sort of setting themselves up. Um, here's one of, uh, an example of one of the membership forms and essentially the, 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 the way that the structure works is that the um, uh, costs are determined by age. So if you're younger, uh, the, the sort of annual costs are lower and they uh, uh, go up higher as you, as you age. So it's been difficult to uh, get a lot of statistics on the actual numbers of repatriation but uh, what I've been able to find here are just two examples. They used to publish all these, but they stopped doing so. And when I asked them for 
more information, they said there's no reason you need to know that. So uh, I, I, um, the figures that I do have here, uh, you see how effective they are in actually fulfilling their mission of repatriation, 2011, 2013 nearly 95, 96 uh, percentage of fund members were repatriated to Turkey for burial. So I learned more about the uh, bureaucratic uh, processes surrounding death and burial by working with uh, five different funeral homes in Berlin. I attended uh, and participated in all aspects of the uh, funeral from preparing the corpse for burial um, uh, locally or uh, taking the uh, bodies to the airport for international repatriation. And I came to understand the undertakers as, as these figures who do much more than bury the dead. They serve as mediators between immigrant families and the German state. And their ability to navigate the regulatory structures of the bureaucracy and the cultural expectations of their customers, I found was a principal source of their professional authority and their occupational identity. So as intermediaries, undertakers guide families through the cultural, religious, political, and legal landscapes surrounding transitions from life to death. In reconciling competing sets of administrative and cultural norms, they preside not only over end-of-life decisions and their theological implications, but also over pedagogical moments of socio-cultural integration in contemporary Germany. So I want to read a few quotes from uh, some of my undertakers uh, to give you a sense of how they, uh, they themselves kind of distinguish between Turkish and German space and funerary practices. So uh, one undertaker who I will call Bülent, he told me that we live in a non-Muslim country, there are laws, we have to go to government agencies, this isn't a village, you can't just bury them that afternoon. And the government agencies in Germany, they're open in the morning, closed in the afternoon, and he goes on to sort of uh, uh, describe this process and says that our people have been living here for 50 years, they could live here for another 150 years, and they wouldn't understand the system of the country that they live in. This was a recurrent trope, the trope of the Anatolian village and this sort of pre-existing mentalities. The undertakers had really internalized a particular narrative about modernity, right? Here's another example. Uh, sort of juxtaposing the village and the, uh, the city. Another undertaker told me that when there's a funeral here, you know, they can do it just like they do in the village. They can repatriate a body quickly, but this is Germany. There are bureaucratic procedures and people don't know this or they know it and don't want to admit it. And because they don't, our work isn't easy. Right? So for the undertakers, the bureaucracy is an inescapable aspect of their day-to-day -day lives. It's at once a source of frustration, but also the basis of their authority. Although they're impeded and annoyed by the endless amount of paperwork and the difficulty of coordinating across a myriad of governmental agencies, they're committed to the logic and the practice of the bureaucratic order. Their ability to navigate the intricacies of the bureaucracy of death is intrinsic to their role as cultural mediators and is a central feature of their occupational identity and also their expertise. So mastery or know-how of the logic of bureaucracy furnishes individuals with a type of capital that can be used as a resource in the pursuit of economic advantage. To be fair, the bureaucracy of death in Germany is quite complex. Another undertaker uh, described it to me as such, describing me, uh, to me the steps leading between a person's death and burial. And he says, in some of the municipalities, the Standesamt is offices are closed on Wednesdays and Fridays. We can't do anything. And on Thursdays, they're only open in the afternoon after two. So if you have a death on a Tuesday, you want to repatriate the body. The earliest it will go is the following Monday because the office is closed on Wednesday. On Thursday, it opens at two. By the time I'm finished, the consulate is closed. And on Friday, it's closed. And everything is closed over the weekend. So it has to wait until Monday. If someone dies on a Monday, we can usually ship the body the next day without all these problems. <laughs> there he is. So, so that dying on one day of the week versus another would bring certain advantages in processing paperwork seems a little absurd. 
But these discrepancies, while acknowledged as a source of frustration, are understood as being central to the legal rational order of the German bureaucracy. Although they're hampered by these constraints, the undertakers, they accept them as an inescapable aspect of life in Germany. Consequently, the ignorance or the indignity of their customers is not attributed to their novice status, because after all, why should anyone know anything about the laws of the dead? but rather as a symptom of a broader and potentially more pernicious problem, a refusal to adapt, accept, or assimilate to German norms. So I found this pedagogical function uh, quite fascinating. And uh, while I was in Germany, it was a, an opportune time to be talking about the undertakers, about their, uh, their own role and their business, uh, because of this passport scandal that, that broke out while I was there, uh, in, in, in which a funeral home had been uh, accused of selling the passports of uh, dead people to uh, would-be migrants to, Germans, to Germany. Um, so in reflecting uh, uh, upon their own position um, between sort of civil society and the state, the undertakers told me that because of this uh, scandal, really they were under a lot of pressure from the, from the German uh, bureaucracy as well and that part of their job, part of their pedagogical role as mediators was not only to teach uh, their uh, customers about the bureaucracy in Germany or the sort of way that things are done, but also to teach Germans about Islam, right? So there's a kind of a two-way mediation. So one of them, uh, Ismail here, he told me that he teaches a lot of classes in hospitals and police stations about the things that people should pay attention to if there's a funeral pointing out that since 9-11 people in Germany are a little uneasy when they, hear the word, when they hear the word Muslim and he tries to alleviate these fears. He continues to tell me that um, uh, uh, people are very afraid and if someone says uh, Bismillahir Rahmani Rahim, the Germans look around and say, you know, what's going on? And in, 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 in his classes he tries to alleviate some of these fears. So there's a two-way pedagogical function happening here. And here's his office in uh, Neukölln um, and he says a little bit more about his own kind of personal appearance and how he tries to serve as this mediating figure. So the uh, first half of my book focuses on the legal and institutional aspects of death out of place, what might be understood as the material conditions of death and burial. In the second half I'm uh, looking at the symbolic dimensions of death and dying in Germany. So scholars of transnationalism have emphasized how the multiple and permanent ties sustained between home and host countries are often accompanied by the social and symbolic construction of places and spaces of belonging. In the context of transnational migration, such processes are produced through the sending and utilization of remittances and also in the performance of certain rituals and ceremonies. I was interested in processes of placemaking and identity construction that took place through the ceremonies and rituals accompanying burial. Uh, one site that I looked for this was through the representation of religious, ethnic, and national identities on the tombstones of immigrant graves. The Greek word for sign, sima, by the way, is also the word for grave. So burial grounds are important sites for the construction of diasporic memory and collective identity. I cataloged over 500 tombstones across a number of Islamic cemeteries in Germany in order to better understand the strategies through which migrant groups attempt to confer fixity on identities that are more fluid or ambivalent in life. Displays of belonging through epitaphs, images, and grave design offer a symbolically powerful way for migrants to demonstrate membership in various communities. By examining the range of semiotic strategies in the iconization of the dead, I want to demonstrate how identity formation extends beyond the limits of biological life. So just to show you a few quick examples, graves are marked uh, as Islamic through the use of religious epitaphs such as Ruhuna Fatiha or simply Fatiha, a reference to the first chapter of the Quran, an injunction for passers-by to pray for the souls of the deceased. Perhaps this is unsurprising that Muslim graves would utilize religious language in memorializing an individual as the practice is common in other religious faiths too, such as Christian graves that invoke Jesus Christ or salvation. 
What was more surprising to me was the prevalence of flags uh, and tombstones in the shape of mosques, which I'd never seen before. The mosque grave brings the mosque, uh, a place of collective worship that might be located near or adjacent to a burial ground, into the heart of the cemetery itself, albeit in miniaturized form. The line between sites of worship, pilgrimage, and prayer become blurred as a grave site is reimagined as something more than a place for depositing human remains. The proximity of the mosque to the grave uh, and to the dead body, uh, excuse me, mimics the medieval Christian practice of burying the dead directly under the grounds of the church. This practice, usually reserved for the rich or for the holy, is given a lease, a new lease in the diaspora cemetery. If you can't bury under the mosque, why not build a mosque over your grave? The use of the mosque form is also an innovative step towards the normalization of Islamic symbols in the German landscape. So finally, through interviews with members of Berlin's Turkish and Kurdish communities, I sought to better understand the different reasons that compel individuals to bury locally or to repatriate and the significance that they attributed to the location of burial. The local burial is becoming um, more common. Approximately 80% of Turkish and Kurdish dead are repatriated still today for burial. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, members of funeral funds are repatriated at an even higher rate, owing in part to the material and moral incentives provided by the funds themselves. So in explaining their own preferences and reflecting on the decisions of others, my interview partners emphasize the role of the family, the significance of territory and soil, and one's own structural position within German society as the most important factors influencing burial outcomes. These factors lend credence to my interviewees' attachments to Turkey and Germany and were central in their narratives about the significance of life, death, and burial in the context of migration. Though I distinguish them here for analytical purposes, narratives about family ties, the significance of soil, and the importance of social position often overlap, complement, and at times contradict each other. Families, for example, can act as both push and pull factors when it comes to determining the proper burial location. Likewise, the soil itself is endowed with a multiplicity of meanings. And feelings of social exclusion can translate either to a stronger desire for repatriation, but conversely, burial in Germany can serve as a means by which to assert one's true place in the political community. So corporeal assertions of belonging deploy the body as an anchor. In some cases, the dead are anchored by their children. As one elderly woman I interviewed in a retirement home told me, when I die, I want to be buried here. My children are here. A Kurdish man who I interviewed at a cultural center whose efforts are directed uh, to individuals from the southeastern province of Tunjeli expressed concern that no one would honor his memory by visiting his grave if he were repatriated for burial. The villages are empty, he told me. If you're buried in Germany, someone can at least visit you every week or on the holidays. They can leave some flowers on your grave or at least come and take a look at it. Some of my respondents viewed the decision to be uh, buried in Germany as a coming to terms with the, the decades-long process of settlement. One of my informants, a Kurdish man in his mid-40s who organizes funerals for the Kurdish community in Berlin and has been living in Germany uh, for more than 15 years, told me with reference to the third generation that they are here for good, God forbid, but when they die they are buried here. This proves that they are here to stay. They aren't immigrants. They are permanent members of the society. He noted that in an earlier era, only stillborn babies were buried in Germany, but that increasingly adults were buried there too. For people who live here, he observed, this place is a part of them. This is a reality. Germany has become like a homeland. We feel freer here. We can speak more freely here. But just as future generations anchor the dead, the dead can anchor future generations. Some of my respondents thought that repatriation was desirable since it would encourage the children and grandchildren of the deceased to maintain a connection to their ancestral soil. 
a Kurdish activist who has lived in Germany as a political refugee for more than 30 years, uh, told me, sorry, that's this one, the third generation is losing its connections to the country. Repatriation is a means to prevent people from severing their ties to their country or soil. This isn't nationalism, he said. People say that your homeland is where you are born, but you should be buried in your own soil too. Finally, uh, feelings of social exclusion were also in, an important factor in motivating individuals to bury locally or to repatriate. Uh, one of my informants, a successful business owner who came to Germany as an infant, told me that our soil is there in Turkey. I want to be buried there too. I grew up here, but that is our soil. We live here, we do everything here, but this place never fully accepted us and it never will. It's not possible. That's why we'll always remain foreigners, so what's the point of being buried in a foreign country? Social death here gives rise to a longing for belonging that can only be achieved after physical death and return to the natal soil. As a retired factory worker told me, I was always an Auslander, I don't want to be an Auslander in my grave. Yeah. So as I hope I've uh, shown today, determining, determining the method and location of burial of immigrants is connected to broader identitarian concerns over the boundaries of national and political communities and the place of immigrants within them. As a SPD member and integration minister for the state of Baden-Württemberg, Bilkay Öne argued during deliberations over Islamic burial in Germany, integration must cover the whole span of life from the birth to the death of a person. While death is undoubtedly a shared, uh, universally shared human experience, it poses distinct challenges for minority communities in migratory settings. Death out of place is a rupture that foregrounds questions that are central to the migratory experience. Who am I and where do I belong? As such, death is a moment of both crisis and opportunity. In confronting loss, Individuals and groups are presented with an opportunity to assert corporeal and symbolic claims on the nation. Through burial decisions, families can signal what they value and where they belong. In light of changing demographic patterns in an aging Muslim population, questions about the burial practices of German Muslims are only likely to multiply. By studying the social practices that link the dead to the living, we are thus better positioned to see how the boundaries of political communities are meaningful and consequential in both life and in death. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So and I think... Fabulous.